if you do go to Paris, you must just make sure you say bonjour or bonsoir before you try and do anything else. And if you do that and try and speak a bit of French, you'll probably have a, a good time. Yeah, I think that definitely helps like learning a little bit. That's really anywhere you go, uh, that learning a little bit of the local language that always tends to put a smile on people's face or at least, you know, make them feel a little bit more pleased and trying to communicate with you. If you are fortunate enough to travel to or live in another country, without a doubt, you will experience some strange cultural differences. If you are not careful, then you can really make a fool of yourself or even get into some trouble. So today's guest, Luke Thompson from Luke's English Podcast is from the United Kingdom, but he lives in France. He will give you some tips to help you to feel more like a local when outside of your native country. So every week we help you to understand fast speech in real life without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. Just like Khadija, who says that now people think he's a native when he speaks English. Let us help you to reach your English learning goals too. But we can only do that if you hit that subscribe button and the bell down below so that you don't miss a single new lesson. One of the things I was also going to ask just about moving to France and everything, uh, living in France, were there any big aspects of culture shock that you experienced? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I experience culture shock all the time, it's, but it's it's hard to put my finger on it, you know. There are certain differences relating to things like directness, um, and French people will tend to be a bit more direct and straight talking. They'll just say what they think, what mm -hmm. they feel a bit more readily. There's that sense that when you, um, let's say if you go to a shop, you've got to go and you've got a problem, you've got to take something back or whatever it is. You, you're you're much more likely to get blunt responses immediately. It might feel unfriendly at the beginning, but there are certain little, like, um, little cultural things that you must do, and then eventually you become much better friends at the end of it. Whereas I feel like in the UK, we're a lot more friendly at the beginning. You know, everything's much easier and friendlier and more polite at the start, but then it can be harder to to sort of make close friends so I don't know communication style is one of them timekeeping Parisian people on average tend to be about 15 minutes later than they are in the UK uh, speaking codes you know uh, French people will speak a lot more there's there's less tolerance of silence um, even physical directness French people I've, in England I don't know what's wrong with us but we do seem to require a bit more personal space and in France that personal space thing is seems to be a bit smaller people take up more of each other's space there's a bit more physical proximity in England we I'm sure we are really conscious of like the people around us and we weave in and out of each other we give each other more more space and stuff whereas in France walking down the street for me seems to be a more complex process queuing we really solidly respect queues in in England and in France sometimes people accidentally on purpose will jump the queue and you know living in France were there any big aspects of culture shock that you experienced yeah definitely I mean I experience culture shock all the time if someone experiences culture shock they suffer from feelings of uncertainty confusion and even anxiety when moving or even traveling to a new country Culture shock can even be experienced on a smaller scale as in when someone moves to a different state or city within their own country. The opposite is also true. After having spent a long time in a foreign country and having gotten used to a different culture, if someone decides to return to their home country, chances are that they will experience reverse culture shock. Let's check out some examples in the conversation I've had with Christina in episode six of Beyond Borders. But you know, Ethan, like by that point, I had also lived abroad so much and mm. traveled so much um in my early 20s up until that point that like um i mean of course everywhere you go takes a while but right. um you know it was not it wasn't <clears throat> difficult in the same ways in the same sort of culture shock ways that it was you know when it was sort of the first couple times i lived abroad did you have like the reverse culture shock and have you taken any parts of brazil back with you 
that's a great question because now that I think about it, like I actually usually have more culture shock coming back to the States than I do going to any country. So what about you guys? I'd love to hear about your living or traveling abroad experiences. Tell us in the comments down below if you ever experienced culture shock and how you dealt with it. But it's, it's hard to put my finger on it, you know? Here, Luke uses an interesting idiomatic expression. To put your finger on something means to know or be able to explain exactly what is wrong, different, or unusual about a situation. Let's start with Claire. CEO, top of her field. She's been climbing the corporate ladder for 25 years. Eats, lives, breathes her work. And one day, she feels a restlessness. She can't quite put her finger on it. So she decides to relieve some stress by going back to the gym. And French people will tend to be a bit more direct and straight talking. They'll just say what they think, what they feel. People who tend to be more straight talking, talk in an honest and direct way. They'll just say what they think, what they feel a bit more readily. If you do something readily, you do it. Unwillingly and slowly, easily and immediately. Because when we went to him and, and asked for his support, for his encouragement with that project, he readily agreed not just to give that support and that encouragement, but also to be the patron of the project. Let's say if you go to a shop, you've got to go and you've got a problem, you've got to take something back or whatever it is. In a shopping context, if you take something you have bought back, you return it to the store. Example, I had to take my new phone back to the store because it was faulty. You're much more likely to get blunt responses immediately. If someone is blunt, they say what is true or what they think, even if this offends or upsets people. Example, Chris can be very blunt and sometimes shocks people who don't know him well. A common phrase is, let's be blunt. This is used before saying something that is true, but unpleasant. Example, let's be blunt about it. The movie was terrible. It might feel unfriendly at the beginning, but there are certain little, like, um, little cultural things that you must do. And then eventually you become much better friends at the end of it. Whereas I feel like in the UK, we're a lot more friendly at the beginning. In English, when we want to emphasize comparisons in the sense that the difference is really considerable, we use adverbs like much, far, way, significantly, and a lot to state that difference. Let's check out some more examples. It's always good to keep in mind, you know, these people are humans. They have the same wants, the same needs. Like what unites us as human beings is far greater than the superficial things that divide us as different cultures, different religions. It's better than nothing. It's just important to be practicing and actually speaking. It's way better than nothing. I don't know, communication style is one of them, timekeeping. If you talk about someone's timekeeping, you're talking about how good they are at arriving on time for things. Timekeeping is also the process or activity of timing an event or series of events. I, I personally, believe it or not, I have many weaknesses, hard to believe. Let me give you a, a true weakness of mine. I'm not good at timekeeping. Universally, human timekeeping has always been related to the sun and its movement across the sky. Even physical directness. French people, I've, in England, I don't know what's wrong with us, but we do seem to require a bit more personal space. Have you ever paid attention to what personal space is like in your part of the world? Do people tend to stand closely to each other or far apart? Personal space refers to the distance that you like to keep between you and other people in order to feel comfortable. For example, when you're talking to someone or traveling on a bus or train, and even standing in line at a bank or at a grocery store checkout counter. We can also say that someone invades your personal space, meaning they stand or lean too close to you, causing you to feel uncomfortable. I feel you. I feel you. So this is definitely one I would use a lot as well. Does it literally mean that you're going up and touching someone? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, so don't actually go up to someone and start feeling them. They might <laughs> find it too, you know, you're getting a bit too close for comfort. You're like in their personal space and they don't like it. Especially especially if you're in English speaking cultures like the US or the UK, people like their, they like their bubble, right? Exactly, you like your <laughs> personal space, the area around you, don't get too close. <laughs> So you do not want to be left behind in this globalizing world. Obviously, a huge part of this is just being able to speak English. 
However, a much more subtle but equally important part is being able to successfully navigate cultural differences and unique perspectives and ways of thinking. And that is exactly why the Real Life app is one of the best ways to practice your speaking. You won't just speak with Brits or Americans. You have the chance to meet people from every corner of the world and experience a plethora of different cultures. And this will all prepare you for English as it is spoken in the real world, whether your goal is to work in an international company or to travel or live abroad. And guess what? With the Real Life app, you can speak English anytime, anywhere, for free. Plus, you get the full interview with Luke and tons of other fantastic teachers and experts with a full transcript and vocabulary definitions. So discover the app that learners around the world like you are falling in love with. Download it now by searching for Real Life English in the Apple app or Google Play Store, or you can simply click up here or down in the description below. And in France, that personal space thing is, seems to be a bit smaller. People take up more of each other's space. There's a bit more physical proximity. The phrase of verb take up has a couple of different meanings. As in the conversation we were talking about space, if something takes up a particular amount of time, space, or effort, it uses that amount. Example, this table takes up too much space in the room. We should buy a smaller one. In England, we, I'm sure we are really conscious of like the people around us and we weave in and out of each other. We give each other more, more space and stuff. It is easier to understand the expression weave in and out of something when you understand what weave means. If you weave a cloth or a rug, you make it by crossing threads over and under each other using a frame or machine called the loom. If people weave in and out of something, they make a similar movement as of the threads. In other words, if you weave in and out, you make a path by moving quickly and changing direction often, especially to avoid hitting things. Example, the driver weaved in and out of traffic at top speed. Whereas in France, walking down the street for me seems to be a more complex process. The word, France is pronounced slightly differently by Brits and Americans. As an American, I would say this word as France, as opposed to France. If you want to learn more about the different ways that Brits and Americans pronounce vowels, this video is a must watch. Let's take a look at a small clip from that. Moving on, another common vowel change is the open ah sound in British English to an air in American English. This a ah is the same in both variants in words like cat and map, but when the spelling is a double r, it is air in American English. So I say carry, and Ethan says carry. Queuing. We really solidly respect queues in in England. A queue is a line of people or vehicles that are waiting for something. Do you know what word we use in American English? Row. Line. Stack. Right. So if people are waiting in a line, we say that they are standing in line. Let's take a look at a part of my conversation with Jennifer from Authentic Journeys, where she mentions cultural aspects of lines in India. And in that part of India, there's this uh, there's this interesting concept of alcohol store where people will stand in line um, to get alcohol. Typically, it's only men standing in line and they stand in a very um, uh, a very organized line. They're very disciplined in that line in India. Luke also used an interesting collocation in this part. We really solidly respect cues in, in England. We use solidly in relation to actions or ideas that are definite or firm. For example, my colleagues solidly agree with me on this issue. And in France, sometimes people accidentally on purpose will jump the queue and, you know. Did you notice that Luke suddenly changed his intonation when he said accidentally on purpose? Accidentally on purpose will jump the queue and... It's common to change the tone of our voices when we want to express a different meaning or even say something indirectly. In this case, Luke expressed anger, excitement, sarcasm. If you are a big fan of Friends, you know that Chandler is very well known for his sarcasm. Let's take a look at this scene where he's being sarcastic. Pay attention to how he exaggerates his tone of voice. 
I don't want to be single, okay? I just, I just, I just want to be married again. <laughs> and I just want a million dollars. Accidentally, on purpose, will jump the queue and, you know. If someone jumps the queue, they move in front of people who have been waiting longer for something than you. In American English, we would say cut in line. Next, I asked Luke if he has any tactics he used to get used to the behavioral differences in Paris. Do you have any tactics that you've kind of used to get more used to these kind of things, to not uh, let them get under your skin? Cultural behavior is usually, um, you know, due to some kind of reasonable thing. You know, uh, you, you might kind of think that, you know, these people are mad. Why do they do it? They're doing it all wrong. But there's usually decent reasons for it. And it's a good idea to understand those reasons and follow them too. Like when I lived in Japan, I learned after a while that you have to do it as the Japanese do. So surviving a hot, humid uh, Japanese summer, the first summer I didn't do very well at all and I got ill and it was horrible. Then I sort of observed the people around me and watched the way they did things and kind of copied them. So that meant the kind of clothes that I was wearing, the way that I slowed down massively, because I noticed so many Japanese people were going so slowly in the summer. They just sort of relaxed um, completely. Um, and plenty of other things like that. Sort of observing the people around, uh, remembering that people do things differently for, for good reasons and maybe trying to kind of do as the Romans do, uh, as we say, yeah. Do you have any tactics that you've kind of used to get more used to these kind of things, to not uh, let them get under your skin? Here, I've used an interesting idiom. If something gets under your skin, it irritates or upsets you. For example, his talking about himself all the time is beginning to get under my skin. Cultural behavior is usually, um, you know, due to some kind of reasonable thing. Due to means the same as, despite, because of, however. However, it's important to point out that due to is mostly used in formal or official context. In everyday English, people more commonly use because of. I'm intrigued to see how, how that's gonna change and if it will change due to mm -hmm. just this centralized culture where people are, you know, on YouTube and they're online all the time. Cultural behavior is usually, um, you know, due to some kind of reasonable thing. If you say that a decision or action is reasonable, you mean that it is fair and prudent. Example, not going to the game that night was a perfectly reasonable decision. You might kind of think that, you know, these people are mad. Why do they do it? They're doing it all wrong. If you say that people are mad, they behave in a wild, uncontrolled way without thinking about what they are doing. Example, when England scored, the crowd went mad. In American English, we say crazy instead. What does mad mean in American English? Excited, angry, depressed. But there's usually decent reasons for it. And it's a good idea to understand those reasons and follow them too. To describe someone or something as decent means that they are socially acceptable or good. Example, the majority of people around here are decent. So surviving a hot, humid uh, Japanese summer, the first summer I didn't do very well at all and I got ill and it was horrible. One of the uses of the verb do is to ask or talk about how successful someone is at something. One can do well or badly at something. It's an urban myth that Albert Einstein did badly at school. In fact, he was a child prodigy. Then I sort of observed the people around me and watched the way they did things and kind of copied them. So that meant the kind of clothes that I was wearing, the way that I slowed down massively. If you slow something down, you reduce the speed of it. So I took audio recordings from the show, slowed them down, repeated them, mm -hmm. and then went to normal speed and then repeated them again. The phrasal verb slow down is also used in reference to how people lead their lives. 
If you are always rushing and don't take the time to take care of yourself, you might want to slow down, meaning that you should be less active and relax more. Having to slow down, especially when you're used to the busy pace of your day, can feel a little bit like a, well, a time waster. But really, it's not. The way that I slowed down massively. The adverb massively means extremely or very much. Some common collocations are improve massively and expand massively. For example, my listening and speaking skills have improved massively since I started using the Real Life English app. And plenty of other things like that, sort of observing the people around. Here, we have another interesting difference between American and British English pronunciation to analyze. In the word plenty, Luke actually pronounces the T sound, plenty. In American English though, we tend to drop the T in some two syllable words when T comes between N and Y. So I would say plenty instead. We can also observe it in words like county, 20, bounty. Let's check out some examples to make this contrast even more clear. I suppose most people associate Franklin's science with lightning. But there's plenty of other stuff. It's quite a long list, actually. There are actually plenty of accent differences that are getting more and more distinct over time. And maybe trying to kind of do as the Romans do, uh, as we say, yeah. The complete saying is, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Sometimes speakers reduce it even more by simply saying, when in Rome. It's commonly used when visiting a foreign country, meaning that you should follow the customs of those who live in it. It is a way of feeling more integrated with a culture that is unfamiliar to you. It can also mean that when you are in an unfamiliar situation, you should follow the lead of those who know the ropes, know how to do a job or activity. And if you're in the UK, maybe you can enlighten us, Andrea, and maybe someone wants to, you know, when in Rome, they want to live the local way. So if they want a cuppa. How might they, like if they go to a place and they order a cup of tea, it's probably not just gonna be like, okay, cup of tea. One of the things I was also going to ask just about moving to France and everything, uh, living in France, were there any big aspects of culture shock that you experienced? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I experience culture shock all the time, it's, but it's, it's hard to put my finger on it, you know. There are certain differences relating to things like directness um, and French people will tend to be a bit more direct and straight talking. They'll just say what they think, what mm -hmm. they feel a bit more readily. There's that sense that when you, um, let's say if you go to a shop, you've got to go and you've got a problem, you've got to take something back or whatever it is. You, you're, you're much more likely to get blunt responses immediately. Which sentence below expresses the opposite idea of blunt? He's sometimes very abrupt with clients. The audience felt offended by his speech. Her response to their criticism was calm and measured. It might feel unfriendly at the beginning, but there are certain little, like, um, little cultural things that you must do and then eventually you become much better friends at the end of it. Whereas I feel like in the UK, we're a lot more friendly at the beginning. You know, everything's much easier and friendlier and more polite at the start, but then it can be harder to, to sort of make close friends. So I don't know, communication style is one of them. Timekeeping, Parisian people on average tend to be about 15 minutes later than they are in the UK. Uh, speaking codes. You know, uh, French people will speak a lot more. There's there's less tolerance of silence, um, even physical directness. French people, I've, in England, I don't know what's wrong with us, but we do seem to require a bit more personal space. And in France, that personal space thing is, seems to be a bit smaller. People take up more of each other's space. There's a bit more physical proximity. In which sentence below does take up mean the same as using a particular amount of space, time, or effort? I took up dancing lessons when I was at school. A good deal of my time is taken up with reading critical essays and reviews. One of our greatest athletes has taken up a new challenge. In England, we I'm sure we are really conscious of like the people around us and we weave in and out of each other. We give each other more more space and stuff. 
Whereas in France, walking down the street for me seems to be a more complex process. Queuing, we really solidly respect queues in, in England and in France. Sometimes people accidentally on purpose will jump the queue and, you know. Do you have any tactics that you've kind of used to get more used to these kind of things to not uh, let them get under your skin? If something gets under your skin, it figuratively means that it irritates you, it hurts you, it scratches you. Cultural behavior is usually, um, you know, due to some kind of reasonable thing. You know, uh, you, you might kind of think that, you know, these people are mad. Why do they do it? They're doing it all wrong. But there's usually decent reasons for it. And it's a good idea to understand those reasons and follow them too. Like when I lived in Japan, I learned after a while that you have to do it as the Japanese do. So surviving a hot, humid uh, Japanese summer, the first summer I didn't do very well at all and I got ill and it was horrible. Then I sort of observed the people around me and watched the way they did things and kind of copied them. So that meant the kind of clothes that I was wearing, the way that I slowed down massively, because I noticed so many Japanese people were going so slowly in the summer. They just sort of relaxed and completely. Um, and plenty of other things like that. Sort of observing the people around, uh, remembering that people do things differently for, for good reasons and maybe trying to kind of do as the Romans do. Uh, as we say, yeah. Nowadays, we have a feeling of what it's like to be a movie star as we continually find ourselves in front of a camera. We have video interviews, live streaming conferences, speeches, and even interactions on social media via video. If you are not prepared, it can be a nerve wracking experience, but it can also be an exciting way to connect with people that you never thought possible. So I asked Jennifer what things you need to consider when communicating on camera. Yeah, actually, people have asked me about this. Should I make gestures on the camera or should I not? Well, how will different cultures respond to this? Since I tend to work mostly between the US and India, at least those two cultures seem to be pretty similar in um, at least what I've seen. Um, as to sometimes use gestures like this just to ex express along with what you're talking.